Hey guys, welcome back to the Tech Spreader Hunting Podcast. I'm going to try something a little bit different tonight. Uh, that is, I'm going to go live over on Instagram. I usually do, do this on Wednesdays when I get a chance. It's been a hot minute since I've done one. Uh, unfortunately, the angles are going to be a little bit different, so I'm going to be looking you know, kind of all over the place, which I already do anyways. But if this goes all right, and there's good questions and good chat and everything else, uh, we'll go ahead and air this. If not, uh, you'll never see this, and Justin delete it. <laughs> so without further ado, uh, be sure and go check out AlliedMunitions.com or for Midland Stop Out Outdoors. Uh, but anyways, to give you a little bit of, uh, if you're not aware, uh, I have an Instagram handle. It's Wade.TheJudge, uh, and I try to go live on Wednesdays for Q&A, and it's what ends up happening is lots of good questions, typically, typically, uh, about uh, just all kinds of stuff, mainly about firearms. Uh, it seems as if that's kind of the direction we go the most of the time. So uh, what I'll do is I'll read off the question and then answer it, and you'll get to hear you know, the Q&A portion. Uh, you know, like I said, if this is too boring then you'll never see it so that's where we're at with this so without further ado we're about about ready to get started i mean it would be handy if i knew what i was doing and i could just stream live to instagram whilst doing the podcast but i'm not that savvy so i just have my phone set up off camera i'll be reading off the questions answer them all that good stuff but anyways hopefully you can hear me i have a uh, some jimmy rigging happening here do I miss you yet? No. <laughs> What's up, 806? Howdy. Thank you. Ever plan on... That's a great question. Ever plan on loading any 22 to 50 ammo? Uh, yes. So, we finally got some brass in. Wasn't my first choice for brass, but we got some brass in. So, give me a couple weeks. Uh it's going to be it's going to be a limited run. I don't, I forget. I think it's out 3000 pieces or so. Like it's not much. Uh it was all I could get. And, and, and you know, the funny thing is I ordered this brass a long time ago, over a year ago. And it just randomly showed up out of nowhere. I don't know which load I'll choose the load yet, but Yes, some 2250 is coming, and it'll be very, uh, the, you know, about 3,000 rounds, and that, that'll be it until I get more brass. I don't know when we're getting more. I was surprised to even see this. Thoughts on Horny Black 6 arc ammo. If uh, if we're talking about the 105 grain boat to hollow point, fantastic. Uh, for the money, I mean, if you want to do it all around, pigs long range planking i have shot some cows with it you know anytime we start talking about those heavier high bc projectiles for cow hunt it's not my favorite but it will get it done like it totally works fine uh yeah i've read a lot of it well we sell a lot of it over on the website i mean uh yeah i you know that's not a good indicator of how great it is that's just an indicator of that's what the 105s and the 80 grainers have been what we've consistently kept in stock as far as factory ammo goes. Uh, but I've ran a lot of 105s, pigs, long-range planking mostly, a few cows, not not too many. Uh, the 80s are a little bit picky, as you know, especially if you're, well, they're not going to be that picky if you're running a traditional style uh, suppressor that has, you know, buco back pressure. That's the, the 80 grainers. Uh but, you know, for a good pig round, plink around, it's totally fine. If we're talking about the 105s, the black. I will say this. I mentioned this in this, I think it was a six art group the other day. Uh, interesting tidbit about factory horny ammo. Uh, you know, you have your 108 EODM, your 105 Botel Hollow Point, the horny black. You have your 103 EODX, and you have now you have your 80 grain EODVT. I'm not saying that it will be true in your platform. I am saying of all the test platforms and six millimeter arc I have, which is quite a few now, 
across the board, the 103s shoot the best the most often. Uh, close second would probably be 105s. I, didn't, I don't know. I had to go drag up some data. But 100%, the 103s consistently put up good groups across all the platforms, just about. Like I, I don't even, I can't even think of one platform, bolt action or semi-auto, that doesn't shoot the 103 EODX as reasonably well. Now, that's sad because the, 103, the EODX bullets are like my least favorite, uh, which, you know, I don't know. I'm getting some more ballistics gel this fall. And we're going to do a lot more testing and see if my opinions have changed on the EODX and other projectiles, RPMs and stuff like that. Because uh, the last time I did ballistics gel test and testing on animals with the EODX in particular was quite some time ago. And I'm being told it's changed, but we'll see. But anyways, uh, Brody sucks to suck. 806 says, I have to rant. As much as you hate 308, I saw you were in a 308 group on Facebook. Send more 6 million arc to Amateen. Misspelled that. <laughs> Listen. 308 is gay. It's, you know, that's what it is. I do load some really good 308 ammo, and I have shot a lot of animals with 308, testing set ammo. Uh... I will talk a lot of shit about a lot of cartridges, especially the older legacy cartridges. But anytime I load ammo for them, they get just as much work as any other one. Like I'm going to give you the best effort I can to give you a really good ammo. Now, I've basically discontinued the 30 out six and 270 line. Uh, there was a couple customers who, you know, wanted custom ammo for their old boomer ass rifles and i was totally fine with that the overruns i sold on the website and it took forever to sell now i would have to assume it's because it's not a remington core lock but those are actually some badass loads especially the 110 v maxes in the 270 and the 30 on six they would nearly uh cut coyotes in half and i loaded in the 270 a 140 grain burger and uh, it was actually quite the performer surprisingly so uh and in the 30 out six, I had some 168s. They they worked great. And you know, they didn't sell. Like that customer base isn't buying custom handloaded ammo. The ones that are using handloaded ammo for those old ass outdated legacy cartridges are loading their own. Uh, but you know, 308, I'm always gonna service 308. It's just not high on the priority list. I did finally get in a bunch of 308 brass four, Kyle Tiro and Ken Ham. Uh, we're going to be putting out some more 22 Creed and six arc next week and the week after, uh, be working on brass prep for the 2250 and the 308. So here in a couple of weeks, you'll see just like anything else, uh, you're going to be fast to get this shit. Now the 110 V max will be available in 308 cow The, uh, can ham, I have a new load offering for can ham. Something I like a little bit more. So I don't know. I may discontinue the old Can Ham 308, even though a lot of people loved it for deer hunting and pig hunting. Because I think the new the new version of it is going to be that much better. I don't know. But anyways. And uh while I'm doing the Can Ham and Coyote Tiro, I'll do some more premier 308 stuff. For those surprisingly, a lot of these people that buy that stuff love it. Uh I would have not, never thought custom hand loaded ammo for 308, like higher in cost, obviously, especially when you load it with ATF, which is very expensive projectile. I wouldn't have thought that had been as popular as it is, but it's very popular. A lot of people love it. But, anyways, enough talk about 308. It's gay. Six arcs the best. <laughs> Can you go over the your cleaning procedure for the chamber and barrel and a bolt gun? Yes. And I have before in previous podcasts and everything else. So I'm going to, uh, sorry, I was already getting like twisted on another question. I'm just going to like simplify this down, uh, on a bolt gun. I don't use, uh, Oh gosh, dang bore guides or anything like that. I just clean my chamber. 
Uh, anytime I clean my raffle, I clean my chamber. Now, you have to be careful not to get any kind of cleaning liquids and solutions and what have you in the chamber and not get them out because that will definitely cause an overpressure situation. Uh, so if you're going to do this, I would highly recommend making sure you get everything out of the chamber. Now, I would just completely avoid using uh, solutions whatsoever in the chamber portion anyways. And my my go-to for cleaning rifles, and I have to clean a lot because uh, I, I try to maintain a certain level of cleaning list in the, all the barrels for testing ammo and everything else. Now, that that's not to say that I don't actually test ammo in dirty barrels. I just kind of keep track of everything really well. Now, it sucks because I hate cleaning rifles, but it is what it is. So I always start out with bore foam. Currently, I'm running uh, pretty much all real Avid products. They literally have, well, except for the suppressor cleaner, that's breakthrough technologies, but everything else is real Avid. And it's not so much for not any other reason other than the fact they had everything I wanted. And Real Avid came out with some new Jags and uh, Jags and stuff like that. And I really liked. So I went and just swapped everything. And we have it at the store up there in Millen. So it was easy swap. And I, I really like their CLP wipes for the AR-15. So anyways, they have a bore foam. So I start out with bore foam. Obviously, pull the bolt uh, out of your rifle. Wipe it down. But... I start out bore foam and I go past the chamber obviously into the barrel. And depending on what caliber it is and how many rounds have been through it, I may bore foam it a couple times before I actually start cleaning. Uh, but at, at bare minimum, it's you know one time with the bore foam, let it sit, like read the instructions, which usually I give it like 15, 20 minutes, and I will take a nylon brush and scrub the barrel. Because most most stuff we load for is like it's going to be stuff that could potentially uh, cause a carbon ring. So I go ahead and brush. Uh, and how much I brush just depends on how far I've let the barrel go before cleaning and what caliber it is and all that stuff. It may just be 10 swipes. It may be 40 or 50 swipes. It just depends on the caliber. Uh, but it also depends on round count. But I go ahead and uh, brush it with my uh, nylon brush and utilizing more bore foam as, uh, you know, my cleaning formula, I guess. And then I'll go ahead and blast it out with, um, oh, what's real avids. It's basically like a brake parts cleaner type formula, like a non-residue uh, blasting compound. You know, I don't remember what the, the name of it is off the top of my head. Blast the barrel several times. That's when I'll start initially getting the chamber, which is with that stuff, the non-residue leaving formula. Now, from there, I'll go ahead and clean the chamber. Now, I have uh, several different bolt lug cleaning utensils that different companies make. I don't remember which one I'm using currently the most, but it basically cleans the backside of the bolt lugs. And that'll be my next thing is I'll go ahead and blast uh, the, the breech face, if you will. I guess is what you call it, and clean it with that. And then I'll get into the chamber uh, with uh, chamber mops is what I call them. I don't know if that's the specific correct term or phrase, but it's basically it's not a it's kind of like a cloth thing that fits the chamber really well. And then I have a different one that will fit into the neck and everything else. So I go ahead and get the chamber good and clean. And I don't stop cleaning the chamber until uh, shit's clean. Uh, if I get any kind of black on the backside of the bolt lugs or anything like that, or in the chamber, or if I see any in the chamber, because I do shoot suppress and it does get dirty sometimes, I'll keep cleaning. I'll clean until the chamber is clean. Once the chamber is clean, I'll start pushing patches. Now, I really like the uh, Real Avid's Jag and patches. They're a lot longer, uh, fit really well. Uh, and, you know, if you keep your shit clean and running pretty good barrels, it's usually not that many patches. And I, what I'll use to this day, like the only chemical I use that's not Real Avid is when I'm pushing patches, I use a uh, simple green. Now, I don't know if this is right or wrong. I don't care. I've just been using it for a long time, and it works. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't seem to be detrimental to the rifling or the barrel or anything like that. So I push uh, patches with simple green sprayed on them until they're clean. And then lastly, I'll start pushing patches again with the brake parts cleaner and or uh, Real Avid's uh, 
gunk buster. I don't remember what the stupid name is, but it's like a chemical, almost like a, a brake parts cleaner that's not going to leave any residue or very little residue. And the last thing to do is I go in and inspect it. Like I go in, if it's if it's like a 22 Creedmoor or 6 Creedmoor that has a, a high round count because I was doing some sort of testing or whatever, I'll go ahead and bore scope it to make sure I got the carbon ring out or if they're, if they're you know, checking on stuff or whatever the case would be. But nine times out of 10, if you maintain a good maintenance schedule, you're going to go ahead and get all that stuff cleaned out uh, with relative ease, especially, again, with good quality barrels. Uh, you know, it seems like a lot, but it's not. And the last thing I do, like I said, is I check everything out with a bore scope or a flashlight on the uh, the uh, chamber side and everything else. Make sure I got all the liquids out there and there's nothing else to worry about. And then I always allow it to dry because, you know, when you're blasting all that shit into the, the chamber there, it's going to get in those threads. And when you flip the rifle up, it's going to seat back out. So go ahead and let it dry for like 24 hours. Uh, make sure everything's out of those threads and then give it one last cleaning with just a dry. Uh, they got these big Q-tips at, I see them a lot at Academy. They're like big uh, gun cleaning Q-tips type deals. I don't know what they're called. I give that one last push in the chamber and all that kind of stuff. Make sure there's no liquids or anything hanging around and then you're good to go. Now, like I said, I know it sounds like a lot, but it's really not, especially if you maintain a pretty regimented schedule. Uh, it's not a big deal. Like it, if you maintain a pretty regimented schedule, they get clean pretty fast. Uh, and, you know, also, like we said, for quality barrels, they come clean a lot easier, especially stainless, you know. But anyways, there's more on it over on the podcast and YouTubes and everything else. You just have to go find the videos and talk about it. But that's it. Like, that's my bolt-action clean regimen. So, now, caveat or additional information. Once a year, I will, any rifle that I use a lot, well, most rifles that I use anyways, uh, I will, whether it be an AR-15, AR-10, I don't shoot AR-10s that much, but a bolt gun or an AR-15, I will completely disassemble them as far as I could take it. If it's easy enough to remove the barrel from the action, you know, depending on what platform it is and all that stuff and how angry I am at it, I'll go ahead and do that. And I do a complete deep clean and I remount everything, torque everything back specs, all that stuff. And, and that's really, that's really for my heavy use rifles, especially my heavy use hunting rifles that when I take it apart, like inside the, the, uh, chassis or stock or whatever, there's always a bunch of blood and hay and grass and all kinds of stuff that you didn't get to. There's also chemicals that leaked out during the cleaning procedure and all that kind of stuff. So go ahead and just the high use rifles, go ahead and break it, break them completely down. ARs as well, uh, and do a thorough deep clean on everything, all the individual components, clean back up the screws, all that kind of stuff, and then put everything back together, torque spec, and I know it's good for another year. Is that a bit much? Probably, but, you know, I'm hard on my hunting. My rifles that I carry a lot hunting, I'm very hard on them. So I treat it like it's a piece of equipment, and I maintenance it properly. But anyways... Thoughts on seating bullets with a with inline dies in the Arbor Press. I don't have any thoughts on that. I suppose I don't follow on inline dies. I use uh Redding uh what are the what all dies I use? Redding Matchmaster seating dies. I use uh I still have a bunch of horny whatever their better dies are with their new micrometer stems, which if you don't, if you have horny dies, competition, dies, whatever the shit they call theirs, uh, and you don't have the new horny micrometers or whatever the hell they're called, uh, invest. That shit is legit. Uh, but anyways, I have reading, uh, competition in type S dies. I think I have some match masters. I don't remember what all I have. Uh, inline dies is not ringing a bell to me. But anyways. Should I should I get a 2250 bolt gun and cut the barrel to 18 inches and run horny superforms 50s? You could do whatever you want. 
18 inches. If you're, well, I guess you're buying factory. If you're hand loading, you could definitely, with the case capacity of a 20 to 50. Now, I, especially now that 22 arcs a thing and to the 22 Creed more, and I still love my Valkyries, even though, like, now that I got the arc going, I would imagine once components are more readily available for the 22 arc, I'm just like, who are you? 224 Valkyrie? With the exception of I may do like a 125 Valkyrie for varmint hunting, because I think it, It'd be a, a a slightly better match, but anyways, uh, back to your question. If you're hand loading, absolutely, you can still get a lot of good performance out of that. Uh, you're still going to get uh, decent performance. I mean, it depends. What are you doing with it? You know, obviously shooting coyotes, but are you primarily shooting up close coyotes? This is going to be totally fine. Roll with it. Uh, if you're wanting to still reach out there pretty good ways, uh, I'm not, not a fan. I mean, I'm not saying it, I'm not saying it can't be done. Just the energy, once it gets out there a little bit further, is not going to be very substantial. <laughs> also, my old buy some. I assume you are not reloading. You're not loading once fired brass. I'd still buy reloads. No. No, hell no. So, brief history lesson about ally munitions, if anybody gives a shit. Originally, we were thinking about getting more into reloading, uh, as well as offering new ammo. And I was also looking at trying to develop a program to where you basically cash in your spent brass and get uh, your new ammo at a lower cost. Now, once I looked into all the reloading aspect and everything else, I'm just like, yeah, uh, if I was to get set up with a, the proper facility and everything else and do the reloading or reman ammo on machines, possibly, I still don't think I'd really want to fool with it. Uh, I'm, I'm too particular about shit. And as far as like hand loading reloads and everything else, like by the time I get done just preparing the brass to be loaded the cost like you're better off buying brand new brass because again i'm very particular about how it looks and everything else i'm not gonna yeah and then as far as like the buying a uh, brass buyback buyback program that i was trying to get set up like i, I tested it out on a about a dozen people and I got back brass that wasn't even the brass, I, the original ammo I sold them. So I'm like, I'm not dealing with that. So at this current time, everything we load is all new components. Now, would I be opposed to loading off of uh, once fired brass? No, if it met my quality standards and if I can get it for the right price. Which I doubt I can nowadays. Uh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Is it necessary to headspace bolt to an AR barrels or just go with it? That's up to you. Oh, you know, it's funny you brought this up because I've been recording podcasts uh, and there's a podcast. I don't know when it'll come out. Just to be completely honest with you basically uh i'm recording shitloads of podcasts to have banked podcast banked uh and it's all information podcasts and we're going to be filming the next couple days to get even more videos banked and we're going to do some range stuff finally uh so i don't you know come hunting season we can focus on hunting and getting the footage of the hunts but anyway like that was completely unnecessary for me to talk about it. it's just funny you brought that up because one of the podcasts, I talk about that very topic. Now, the short answer is just go with it. If you don't have the shit to do it, if you don't know what you're doing or whatever, just go with it. If it runs fine, all that shit, it's going to be fine. Uh, in fact, I I built several ARs before I had I even checked Headspace on one, one ever. Uh, but nowadays, from my standpoint, now... 
the reason why I do it so much nowadays is because I'm making ammo and I'm also looking at offering some uppers on the website soon. So I've been doing a lot of shit. So I started headspacing bolts, uh, checking headspace on bolts quite some time ago. Because also I want to know, you know, how much headspace it has and all that kind of stuff for data and all that shit. I can tell you this. I've only had one circumstance at this point. I've only had one circumstance where uh, a barrel was headspaced to the extreme limits, like literally one foul away from being out of Sammy spec uh, based on their drawings and everything else. Other than that, I've had zero issues. Now, keep in mind, if we're talking about 5.56 five, five, or 2.23 or you know, 223 wild, whatever, keep in mind, ARs are going to have more headspace than bolt guns. That's just a given. Well, they should. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, they're, they're a lot sloppier mechanism. They're a lot dirtier. And keep in mind, like, if you have, you know, a significant amount of headspace, uh, that's, that's, it's kind of good in AR 15 platform, especially if you're running a traditional style suppressor, because essentially you're dumping all kinds of shit back into your, your barrel, your system. It's getting in that chamber. Like, don't blame me. Just look at your chamber after you fired like 10 rounds. Uh, that's going to take up some of that excessive space. Now it needs to be a little bit. I don't know if I'd say it needs to be. It probably should be a little bit more than your typical amount of headspace that the bolt action has. But I mean, I've also got ARs that don't have, like they have, you know, their head spaced off of the, the same scenario as like a bolt gun. Uh, I think four thou or four or five thou. I don't remember. Uh, but I do have to keep those much cleaner. So, I mean, to answer your question, <laughs> you know, I went on a little rant there. To answer your question, no, unless there's a problem. Now, would it kill you to get some gauges and just no? Uh, no. But do you have to? No. There, there, there is one thing I would recommend almost always. If you're buying whatever bolt from whatever manufacturer, if they offer a bolt with their barrel, not even the whole BC, just the bolt, more than likely it was headspace to that bolt or whoever manufactures that bolt or whatever the case would be, go ahead and get that bolt uh, if you're worried about it whatsoever. But, yeah, you know, don't get too caught up in the small shit. It's up to you. I mean, like I said, I built a lot of freaking ARs and never had space one of them. <laughs> you know, and they've been fine. But nowadays, you know, I've built lots more uppers and ARs since I started headspace and everything, and they've all been fine. But just keep in mind, if you're going to get uh, headspace gauges for AR-15 rifles, be sure and get a go, no go in a field gauge if it's available. Or if you don't have a field gauge available for it, you can always just, you can literally just get a go gauge and use tape on the end of it and turn that into a no go. Or if you get the go and no go in a package, you can definitely put a couple of slices of tape on the end of the no go to make a field gauge. Field gauge essentially just a little bit more, uh, a couple foul longer for AR 15s, essentially. I mean, if we're being completely honest about it. But, anyways. Uh, Southeast Coyotes, uh, you know, or Caribou, curious what kind of velocities that would bring. 18 inch running 50s. Uh, I think box printed velocity on a 50 grain V Max is probably 37, 3,800 feet per second. You know, realistic is probably 3750, something like that. Uh, you might as well just say you're going to, you're going to at least lose at minimum, probably 25 feet per second per inch. Could be more. So, I mean, that's a hundred feet per second, 20 inches, 28. Uh, so hundred and 150 feet per second slower. So let's just say 3,600 still going to be relatively flat shooting. Now, one thing I will encourage you to do before doing said procedure Kind of do so. I mean, if I had my notes from it, I could tell you exactly what the velocity was going to be. Uh, but, anyways, before you go do this, buy a rifle, send it off to have it cut down, and all that kind of stuff. 
uh, because you want essentially you want a more compact rifle because I'm assuming you want to run a suppressor uh, for a varmint hunting rig. I would urge you to figure out what the velocity is, run some ballistics on that bad boy, uh, say zero to 500 yards, and then check out some ballistics on an 18 inch 22 arc. Just saying. Daytime scope, 22 inch six arc boat gun. It depends. <laughs> I need a it depends button. Uh, what are you doing with it? I mean, obviously you're daytime hunting. What are you only daytime cow hunting? Uh, are you going to be long range plinking? Give me some more specs here. How far are you shooting in budget? Oh, I'm assuming he's replying to the guy about 22 inch six arc budget. Uh, he ruined it. Budget's going to be my next question. But anyways. Uh, 806 says he's going to buy some through an ammo. Boomer. <laughs> no, Bradley. Uh, Bradley's commenting on the 308 is gay joke. It is. It is a joke, but it is gay. Let's be honest. <laughs> the only thing that interests me about, the only reason why we manufacture, and some of you may already heard this many times, I don't know. The only reason why I started manufacturing 308 ammo, the only reason is because I made up some really nasty cow hunting ammo uh, for the 308, for a brush buster, essentially. Uh, for those that don't know the story, I wanted an ammo that I could hit a coyote anywhere in the brush running 16 inch bolt guns. We're running a fix and a cross. I wanted to be able to hit a coyote anywhere because the brush is so thick and it plants the coyote. Now there's lots of different options, and everything else, but we're wanting a 16 inch bolt gun. So keeping it lightweight, compact as possible. That was going to anchor them. And the ammo I came up with originally was uh 110 Varmageddon's that were spicy as shit. And they would literally blow cows into chunks. It was the greatest thing I've ever seen as far as dispatching. Literally just close range. I mean, no shots further than 150 yards. Majority of them within 50. Just completely knocking down cows. And plant, no matter where you hit them. Uh, in fact, it would basically decapitate them if you shot them in the neck. Uh, couldn't get those projectiles for a while. I think I actually got some. I don't want to get people's hopes up. But I think I did finally get some. I don't remember now. But uh, the 110 VMAX was the next best thing. Uh, and that, again, that's out of 16-inch bolt guns. When I took that load, I actually bought a 308 just to test this ammo with a longer barrel to see what would happen. So I bought a 24-inch Howa 308 and run those 110s. It just, it's pretty gnarly. I'm just going to go with that. Awful, awful cartridge. <laughs> It is a joke, but it's also not. Like, I'm not just not a fan. Uh, there's way better cartridges nowadays. Uh, but I'm also like, you know, whatever. Don't care. When breaking in a 6R gas gun, how hot can the barrel get before I need to cool it down? <laughs> Anytime I'm breaking in any rifle, unless it's like a, a garbage berm thumper. Anytime I'm breaking in any rifle, I don't let the barrels get hot. I I go through the same breaking procedure unless the manufacturer calls for something else, which is a couple shots clean, couple shots clean, couple shots clean. I don't never melt the barrels down. Uh, that's just me, you know. You can do whatever you want. I will say this. This is what made me believe in proof research. Now, People like to throw shade at them because they're more expensive and all this other bullshit. And, you know, anybody's going to, any manufacturer out there is going to have some sort of bad story attached to their product. I don't give a shit what anybody says. I have a lot of proof research barrels, the regular stainless barrels and carbon fiber wrap barrels. The first, very first rifle I got with a proof research barrel on it bought a case of ammo 
during the middle of the summer, I think it was summer, I don't know, it's pretty warm, and started shooting and never stopped. That's 200 rounds. And it's still, like, the big, the biggest group it opened up to was, like, a hair over an inch. It was pretty amazing. Uh, it sold me. Because I thought that barrel was going to be toast. And it was a 6.5 Creedmoor. That's what sold me. I've been running lots of proof research barrels ever since. I've had fantastic luck out of them. I mean, I'm not saying they're the best. Because I have tons of other barrels that shoot fantastic as well. I have cheap, shitty barrels that shoot fantastic. But I will say this, like I, I have done some pretty long strings of fire on those barrels and they've held up very well. I'm not saying, you know, you need to do that. And I'm not saying, you know, it's bad for them. I'm just saying I just don't never melt down a barrel when I'm breaking it in unless it's like a shitty chrome lined. It's it's never going to be nothing more than a berm thumper, meaning like a, a CQB type rifle and everything else. And I'm just kind of messing around. I'll get up there and melt the barrel down. I don't give a shit. But anything I'm worried about accuracy and precision on, I do the same procedure, which is shoot a few rounds clean, shoot a few rounds clean, until I get to at least 20 rounds. And then I'll go ahead and start shooting a little bit more liberally, you know, maybe 10 rounds instead of five. It just depends on the temperature outside. I know that didn't exactly answer your question. But I don't exactly have a great answer for it. I don't have the exact temperature or anything like that. Just shoot it a couple rounds, let it cool off. If you're going to do a break-in procedure, clean while it's cooling off. Shoot a couple rounds. I could definitely see where it'd be detrimental, especially if uh, it's a you know certain barrel manufacturers don't have any kind of. <sighs> That's a whole nother. I'm just gonna stop there. It's a whole nother conversation that can lead into a. A really long talk about barrel manufacturing. I don't, I don't feel like doing it tonight. <laughs> what barrel for an 18-inch 6-arc AR? Depends on your budget. Depends on what you're doing. Uh, also, I haven't tested all the 6-arc barrels out there. I've tested a handful of Ballistic Advantage, and I've had good luck at them. Every single proof research AR barrel I have shoots amazing. That's why we're selling them on the website. Every single one of them has has been, like when you bore scope them, every single one of them look fantastic. They come with a gas tube. If it's, uh, you know, the 18 and 20s and 22s, I believe. Uh, the machine work is, I have never looked at a proof research barrel on my bench that the machine work wasn't phenomenal. Now, I've also seen shitty looking barrels with chatter marks and all kinds of shit end up shooting just fine. But that's at close range. Where I feel the buying the higher quality barrels that have been lapped and all this other bullshit really comes into play is when you're going to start shooting long range and the inconsistencies on the barrel itself are going to impregnate or actually mess up the projectile and f just mess up your BC down range. That's where it's really going to come into play, buying quality barrels. But if you're predator hunting a couple hundred yards, whatever's available. Only thing I'm going to tell you is, if you're intending on running 80 grain EODVTs, unsuppressed or with a flow-through style suppressor, make sure it has a larger than, I think it's point, you want to make sure it's larger than point eight, point zero eight five gas port, I think is where I'm at right now. Don't hold me to that. And at least a rifle length, preferably a rifle plus one, somewhere around there. But past that, I haven't tried them all. Uh, I'm working on it. I don't know why, but I'm working on getting more uh, different manufacturers barrels. I mean, I kind of hate doing it because I just had a scenario, which you're going to have to wait for the podcast here about it, where I bought a handful of barrels and they sucked. <laughs> I, had to, I had to uh re-record that podcast. I was pretty spicy when I first talked about it. You ever load 110 to 130 grain 308? Yes. We've sold a ton of 110 VMAX in the past. Uh it's coming back soon. 22 arc SB build. I'm thinking so. I'm thinking so. <laughs> 
Is it worth getting into that 22 arc? I think so. Uh, I have some podcasts coming up talking about velocities and all that kind of stuff. So far, I'm really enjoying shooting those rifles. Uh, like I said, it, it it's definitely killed my Valkyrie sales. Uh, and I, you know, now owning one and shooting it, I haven't even started loading for them yet, but shooting the, even just the factory options, and everything else. It's a fantastic performer. Uh, keep in mind, all the 22 arcs I currently have are all proof research barrels. It's starting to sound like a proof research commercial, but then, you know, higher quality shit and they all shoot fantastic and great performance. Uh, I mean, is it worth it? I can't really answer that for you. Am I glad I got into them? Yes. Uh, will we eventually offer ammo? Cause I know that question is coming. Yes. I don't know when, uh, we're so behind on everything else and brass is not even available yet. Uh, so <clears throat> I liked it and it's, it's kind of a sleeper on a long range plinker. Now we'll be covering that soon in some videos. You'll see me killing coyotes with them this, this winter. That's for damn sure. How far would you disassemble an AR for a cleaning? Let's say it's horribly filthy. Completely disassemble that bastard and get it clean. <laughs> that's just me. Uh, that's just me, though. If they're really, really filthy, I'm just going to take that shit apart. I'm going to take it apart, get that barrel. I'm going to let that barrel soak in lots of freaking uh, boar foam before I even start messing with it. I'm going to scrub the piss out of it. All that shit. I'm going to go ahead and blast out the gas tube and all that kind of shit. I'm going to go ahead and because I run, you know, the Superlative Arms gas box almost exclusively now. Because after you get used to having all that adjustability and the option to bleed off, uh, I'm all about that. Well, on my 5.56 and 2.23s, I don't give a shit. Like, if I build a new one, I'm going to put it on there. But I'm not going back and replace them. I have started going back and replacing all the other gas box I was trying on all my other uh, 6 arcs, 22 arcs, and Valkyries, and Grendels, and all that shit. Because I like them so much. Uh, I go ahead and clean them. If you're, if it says in the in the instruction manual, if you're not running it in the bleed off portion, you need to dab it with some sort of I think it's oil or something like CLP or something like that every once in a while. But I go ahead and blast them out when I clean my rifles. But if a rifle is horribly filthy, an AR-15, I'm just I'm disassembling that batch and I'm getting it real good and clean. But, you know, but it's also me. I know I'm, you know way too anal about certain things, but it's easy for me to do. Cause I'm, you know, got workbenches and all kinds of shit and all the tools to do it very quickly and efficiently. <laughs> Kyle Clint says we are predator hunters. Of course we don't clean our shit. I know <laughs> I've had a lot of predator hunters rifles run across my bench over the years and they are always one the, the biggest mistake I made back when I used to mess with more people's rifles, used to have more people out here doing stuff and all that kind of stuff. But really, when I had more time, I mean, that's what it boils down to. My biggest regret is not taking more pictures of them because they have predator hunters always had the filthiest shit and they always have the most unique wear marks. There's always stories behind scratches and dings and dents and all kinds of shit. I should have took more photos back then. And at some point, I want to do something where I can I can take a lot of photos of Pratt Hunters rifles after a season of hunting. I think it'd just be so cool. I, you know, maybe it's just me. I love, you know, firearms are cool. All types of firearms are cool, except for 308's gay. But I really like all the small details on firearms. That's why it, a lot of times when I do reels, it's it's you may see one picture of the full platform, but it's a lot of the small details. That's stuff that I find really cool. And looking at Predator Hunters rifles that have been used for years and seeing where all the wear marks are and all the dirt is, all that shit, that shit just it's super interesting to me. I love I love it. But anyways. How is the Smith & Wesson 6 arc running? About the only production gun available with the exception of Santan. So far, so good. So far, so good. I'm 
completely happy with that purchase. In fact, I'm going, I've got a, uh, you know, they made a 16 inch and they, they, uh, that's, that's, you know, there's more production rifles than that, but the total side tangent here, uh, they have a 20 inch and I'm definitely going to get one of those. I have one set aside at Ally. I'm definitely going to get one, build it out and see if it shoots just as well. Uh, so anyways, back to the, you know, Santan, obviously there is lots of other manufacturers, uh, probably some of the more, I mean, Santan's not cheap. Uh, CMMG, I don't know nothing about that one. I still haven't got one. I'm very hesitant about getting a CMG 6 arc because there's no forward assist. And that's just, you know, I don't care what people think, whether you need it or not. That's just a personal preference for myself. So that's why I don't own one. Uh, I've seen, I've had to use it way too many times because shit's dirty and all that kind of stuff. Now, if you roll with a, uh, the gas block that has the bleed off function and a flow through style suppressor or, you know, loading ammo that's really tuned to your rifle. You need that, uh, Ford assist way less. I can promise you that this is way cleaner, but anyways, uh, I've been eyeballing the same but they're pretty expensive for what they are. There's also a company, uh, they just came out with the twin arc. I'm drawing a blank. Some reason I want to rise armament, maybe. Uh, has one Smith and Wesson, CMMG, uh, be Santan, uh, Black Blackout Defense is fist and drop theirs, I believe. Or actually, I think it's already available on the website. It's just a really long wait time, which sucks. I love my Blackout Defense rifle. Um, I know there's a couple more. I'm just drawing a blank. You're not. No, you don't see a lot out there. Well, it doesn't seem like you see a lot out there in the market. Uh, but anyways. Oh, one more thing. What's the typical barrel life of a 2250 look like on the internet, which means it's got to be true. <laughs> People are saying somewhere from 1,500 rounds to 30,000 rounds. Is this true? Yes. It also depends how you're treating it. If you sit down that bitch at a prairie dog field and burn her down, I, I bet it don't even go 1500. Uh, it all depends on how you maintain your rifle. That's what, what it boils down to. I will tell you this, uh, in this studio, I don't have the barrel anymore, but in this studio is a how, uh, now right now it's a 20 degree more that's burnt out, but it started its life as a 20 to 50. That particular rifle had in excess of like 6,000 rounds down that barrel. There was literally only about six inches of rifling, discernible rifling left at the end of the barrel, and it would still hold a little over a one-inch group of hand loads. Now, I was literally loading up to 68 grainers and pushing them out as far as I, sitting them out as far as I could. And, it, you know, like I said, it just, it got so clunky I had to rebuild, uh, I had to get a new spring for the bolt, put a new trigger in it. Obviously, we, you know, pulled the barrel. Now, the, the biggest mistake was I asked the uh, rifle builder to save that barrel because I want to have it m milled in half for the studio. He didn't. Sad, sad day. But anyways, uh, depends on how you treat them. Treat them right. They're going to last you a long time. Meaning, keep it clean. Yeah, and don't melt that bitch down. Or melt it down. And just know, barrels are consumables. They're not that expensive. <laughs> What's your favorite trigger? Trigger tech, cross the board. <laughs> I, I, am, uh, I believe the kids call it simp. Simping, if you will, uh, for trigger tech. Some of the best bolt gun triggers, in my opinion. There might be new shit out there that's better. I don't know it because I stopped testing triggers a long time ago when trigger tech became more prevalent. And I've started really, really enjoying the trigger techs in my AR as well. And uh, I have, a, you know, I went down that road on AR as well, trying all the different triggers. Past trigger tech, drop in on AR. My second favorite is probably, probably one of the guys leaves. I don't know. 
second place is a tough one because blackout defense makes a, a a trigger, a drop in trigger that's really nice. But I have the most of trigger tech shit uh, in my bolt guns and in my uh, ARs. Oh. Prefer two stage, but that's all I lack. Finish my two six arc builds. Get a trigger tech if you want to drop in. If you don't want to drop in because you're one of those people, <laughs> just get the Geisley. Geisley makes a great two stage. I don't remember what it's called, but I love it. What's your 22 Creed? 53 Green Van? What? I don't have a 22 Creed. Oh, you're talking about that. I'm not telling you. Uh, It's a fast, faster burning powder. That's all I'm telling you. What's up? What's up, Mr. Stewart? Uh, you missed the last couple lives because I didn't I haven't done any. Uh I've been I, I was naughty boy, I guess, over on my personal account and Instagram banned me from doing lives, but that's it. I don't I don't know it's strange. Uh so I haven't been doing them. Uh well I did the live where we did the drawing for munitions uh July. Ninth, I believe. I don't remember. That was the last time I did a live. And I really didn't answer that many questions. But anyways. Yeah, I haven't been doing them. And I thought I was finally off of my probation here. My live probation. And I tried to go live on my own Instagram. It wouldn't let me. So that's why I jump over here on munitions. Thoughts on 22 Arc? I uh, like it. I dig it. I'm going to. I have several. And I'm going to have several more. And we will eventually offer ammo for it. Six or twenty-two car, ugh, six or twenty-two arc for coyote hunting with thermals out to three hundred yards, uh, based off of factory available ammo. I would pick the twenty-two arc for those sixty-two grain EODVTs, and we're talking about factory horny shit, uh, and your specific use case. Go with the twenty-two arc. Yeah, 300 yards is not shit for the 62 ELD VT, especially if you're running like a 16 or 18 or 20 inch barrel. Uh, pretty gnarly. <laughs> how is it? <laughs> how does it feel to be the leading expert in six million arc? Uh, my pocketbook feels it. <laughs> I you know I really liked the the cartridge essentially revived well I'm going to I'm going to throw an extra thing on this. The cartridge essentially revived my love for having AR15. Uh because it was finally a cartridge that I actually do something with. Now, I'm not saying you can't kill shit with a 223 or 506 cuz I've killed tons of animals. But we all know, if we're being completely realistic for ourselves, it is maxed out at certain ranges. Now, I have myself shot plenty of hogs with the 223 or 506 and a few whitetail, but it's capped out at certain ranges. When you start looking at the performance of the 6 millimeter arc in the AR-15, to me, it was a, it was a no-brainer. Uh, and now that the the Valkyrie, it, you know, it kind of got me there, but it, there was a lot of problems around the Valkyrie. But the 6 arc really took over, and now the 22 arc is fantastic as well. Give it a little bit of time, we'll probably have the most information out about the 22 arc. But pre six arc, we probably put out the most amount of information on 22 Creed. Uh, I will have some updates on 22 Creed soon because of the new projectiles, different powders, and all that kind of stuff. That'll be another long podcast. And I've done several small podcast updates on the six arc, but I'm working on another full one, an updated six arc podcast. Uh, with all the gassing information, buffer tubes, uh, buffer links, buffer weights, all that kind of shit. Because the flow through suppressors are going to change AR game. Now, the, these AR manufacturers, uh, barrel manufacturers, and everything else, they might as well pay attention and get on board and start making some adjustments to their platforms. Because it definitely changes changes shit a little bit. And, you know, we'll talk about that later in another podcast. I also, I, I wouldn't say I'm the leading expert. I'm just a person who won't shut up about it. <laughs> uh, what boat head or BCG do you recommend for the arcs? And will a 6.5 Grindel BCG work? Also, don't understand the difference in the Grindel Type 2 boats. 6.5 Grindel is a 6 arc boat. 
And if it's a type two, funny you mention this, I recorded, and they'll air soon, I believe, podcasts about these very topics. Type one is typically known as a 7.62 by 39 bolt. It's a shallower bolt face, if you will, than the type two. Six arc, six five grinnel. There was some early shit, but most modern stuff, six five grinnel, six arc, 22 arc, have they utilize the type two bolt, uh, which is a six five grinnel, six arc. Now, as far as recommendations on what bolt to use, I don't have any right now. I'm still testing bolts. And guess what? To all those people out there that said, that, you know, it's going to shear lugs and everything else, I have yet to see it happen. And I've shot a shit ton of six arc ammo through ARs. Uh, and, and some of the bolts I'm using, not BCG, but bolts I'm using is what people would consider cheap shit. Uh, I think they've really got it figured out nowadays. Also, if you make sure your rifle's properly tuned, you're probably not going to have any issues. I say probably, but you, you never know what's going to happen. Like, yeah, I don't have recommendations uh, because I haven't seen any fail yet. I want to do some testing. I'm not going to spill too much on this because we may do a video series to kind of debunk some shit about around the bolts and everything else. Uh, and the more people ask, the more I want to do it. It's just going to cost me some money as far as like just to destroy a bunch of bolts. But maybe we'll do it anyways. Because I, I mean, I'm tired of like waiting to see if one of these fucking bolts is going to shear like everybody claims, which they have it. Uh, man, I just, you know. Go watch. This is what I'm going to recommend you do. Now I'm working on. I'm working on some uh, BCG uh, podcast videos, which they won't come out for a while. Uh, it's informational type series talking about coatings and all kinds of shit like that. But I'm going to recommend you go watch uh, School of the American Rifle. Him talk about BCGs and coatings and everything else. So you have a good idea about coatings and everything else, and then just start reading, uh, reading the manufacturer's specs and everything else. Past that, yeah, I don't, you know, I just, I don't have a recommendation because I, I generally will buy what is considered to be higher quality bolts. I have a lot of different ones, full BCGs and bolts. And I haven't had, had any issues out of any of them. Now, that's right now. That could change. <laughs> you, know, I don't, you know, I don't I, just buy something that's, buy something from a reputable company. How about that? <laughs> Anyways. Aero Precision 6.5, 6 arc BCG. You want a Type 2 for the arcs. I'm currently running a Rexus Ultra Bolt in my 22 arcs. So far, I've ran 1,050 rounds between my 22 and 16-inch barrels. I hear a lot of stuff about Rexus. That's one of the bolts I don't have yet. I uh, hear a lot of good stuff about theirs. But I had so much, like, it's so much, so many bolts in my periphery I had to test first before I started venturing out and getting into other shit. But I will be definitely checking out a Rexus at some point. Like I said, you know, takes money to do all this shit, and it's not cheap. <laughs> what is the best grain bullet you have found for all oh, the anticipation? For what? <laughs> what is the best grain bullet you have found for the 22 Creed? Across the board for coyote hunting, I love the 75 grain EODM. That's what we loaded the most. Uh, for predator hunting no it's not going to be fur friendly uh, if you're going to be long range plinking and or shooting whitetails bump it up into the 80s and take you know dealer's choice burger eodm whatever uh, if i was going to be hyper focused on just shooting whitetail calling out whitetail a little bit of plinking out to say sub you know thousand yards in 88 grain eodm tends to be pretty good but if you're going to really want to do some super long range plinking with 22 Creed more, uh, get a burger, more consistent BCs. More on that later. 
Have you tried Oregon Mountain Rifles carbon fiber barrels? I have not. I am familiar with them. I do a lot of window shopping of them, but I haven't yet. What grain bullet shoots the best out of a out of seven twist six arc? It depends. <laughs> uh, I haven't tried all of them, all the bullets. I have tried a lot of bullets. I have tried a fair amount of seven twist rifles. The good thing about a seven twist or seven half twist is they shoot a lot of bullets very well. Now, what grain is going to shoot the best? It depends on the barrel length, probably more than anything. But the seven or seven and a half twist is going to lack a lot of shit all the way up to 100, 109 grainers. Uh, it should shoot anything good from 55s all the way up to 109s. Now, what's the best? I don't know. That's going to be determined by your rifle, your barrel. <laughs> I'm glad I don't clean my guns. Just lube trend is dying. So effing stupid. Clean your shit. I agree. It is stupid. And I blame all these YouTube homos for like, yeah, they thought it was cool. If that's your thing to not clean your rifles, I don't give a shit. Go for it. But it's not cool. It's actually quite stupid. And then, you know, that's also what causes a lot of issues and people, oh, it's a shitty bolt. Well, you know, when was the last time you cleaned your rifle? Well, I've got like 10,000 rounds down in. <laughs> Just saying. How's the cat Noah been treating you? I like it. I dig it. I dig the shit out of it. Uh, we'll be talking about that soon on the podcast. Do you run bleed off or adjust on your six arcs? It depends. Most of, depends on the, so many factors. <laughs> if you're running a flow through style suppressor, you almost can't. And some ammo you can't even get into the bleed off. Some ammo you can't. Uh, but it also depends on the gas system length and gas port size. But if I can, I will. I want to take as much gas as that system as possible. I want to have that bitch chugging along towards it's, it's properly running and cycling within a certain temperature range with the with the knowing in the back of my mind like when it gets colder i'm probably going to have to turn off the bleed off with the flow through style suppressors with a traditional style suppressor now it's funny i i, I was doing some testing on another project the other day well also it's been like two weeks ago that led me back to testing some traditional style suppressors on the six arc which i haven't shot uh, more traditional style suppressors on six arc or 22 arc in quite some time because now I have three Hux works and I have the one Cat Noah. I have some CGSs with their vented end caps on the Smith and Wesson. So a lot of venting going on here. Uh, the moment I stuck that tradition, I'm like, who in their right goddamn mind would want to do this? <laughs> it's like going from the flow through style suppressors and vented gas blocks and really tuning the system very well to where it's like literally no blowback and getting into a traditional and I'm just like no no freaking way so if i'm running a traditional style suppressor 100 i'm opening that bitch up i'm opening it up all the way i can and if it's still functioning properly i'm going to get a gas defeating charge handle which i run pretty much extensively on almost all my ars now the radian raptor sd now, there are other gas-defeating charging handles out there on the market. I haven't tested them. Uh, we carry the Radians at the store. I'm definitely going to put some on the website soon because those are some damn good charging handles. And ask me how I know. Uh, during testing, I will try some crazy shit sometimes, running up pressures and everything else. And there's, it's not, it's, I'm no stranger to getting uh, stuck rounds. I'm not going to say every Radian can handle this, but several of my Radians have been, have had the shit beat out of them with a hammer. And I have yet to break one yet. Now, I've seen lots of other charred handles. They don't pass that hammer test. Just saying. But anyways, to answer, like it's a super long answer to your question. Yes and no. It depends. If I can, I will. 
So, I mean, while we're on the subject, I'm going to go ahead and put this out there. It's as, as it pertains to the 22 arc, six arc, it, hell, even the Grendel. Uh, running suppress and the adjustable gas blocks and the bleed off and all that shit. Like this is the best way to set up your AR-15 platform, especially this time of year with whatever ammo you're running, whatever the case may be. The best way to have this these uh, these rifles set up is with a larger gas port, and I've I've come to realize that like just having a a larger gas port is optimal. Than rather than a smaller gas port, because you can always cut the gas off via the gas block. Having a adjustable gas block is optimal. Having a adjustable with bleed off gas block is optimal, such as the superlative arms. You want to tune your rifle as such to where it's performing very well, soft shooting, but have the ability to add pressure into the system. Now, that's where it comes into play of um, I want to try and tune my rifles to run very well in the gas bleed off mode. If I can, that way, once I get into those extreme cold temperatures, I can just cut that off and go back to no restriction uh, mode in the gas block because you're you're definitely going to run into these colder temperatures if you if you tune this time of year. And you're tuning, you basically, like a lot of people like to really get them like super soft shooting, which I'm, I'm about that life. But if you set up your rifle to where it only runs in this uh, temperature range and everything else, the time you get into these extreme cold temperatures, it's going to fail you. Uh, so being into the gas bleed off, one, it's going to take more gas out of the system itself. Uh, but two, it's going to give you the ability to have adjustment when these colder temperatures come and things don't like to run as well. Uh the temperature of the ammo, the ambient temperature, and everything else is much slower. You're going to need to increase back pressure because the pressure of the ammo is much further down, especially factory horny stuff that's loaded with ball powders and all that kind of stuff. I don't know. That's not what you asked, but I figured I'd save a lot of people a lot of work here. Now, to add on to that, I also like to tune my ARs with a, no matter the buffer length system, like I've been trying all kinds of different buffer springs, uh, the A5 stuff and, you know, carbine length, all the different buffer weights, all that kind of shit. I mean, here's the thing that I've just about determined. I want to tune my rifle with a little bit heavier buffer weight. We're going to, no matter what it is, I'm going for the softest shooting uh, AR I can get. So I'm going to run a little bit heavier buffer most time if I can get away with it. Also, that'll aid you in those colder temperatures. You may be able to do something as simple as swapping out to a, carrying a little bit lighter buffer weight, swap out to the lighter buffer weight, and it still be able to function just fine in those colder temperatures before you even start messing with the gas block. Make sense? Maybe? I don't, yeah. Anyways, what's your thoughts on a 6.5 PRC running through a Savage long action? Will it cycle? Fine. Probably, but I actually don't know. I don't have any Savage long actions. So I couldn't exactly tell you more than likely, but I'm not going to stamp a yes or no on it. <laughs> Would you build a 2250 and a one set twist? Absolutely. No. <laughs> if I'm wanting something with a faster twist, I'm going to step right up to a 22 Creed more or, or go ahead and just get a, a freaking 22 art. Specifically because from a factory ammo standpoint, there's no there's no factory ammo that's going to run. It's going to be give you the performance you're looking out of a one in seven twist for whatever reason in a twenty to fifty. Uh, that cartridge and reamer designs were never designed to run heavies or anything like that. Although you can get custom chambers and you can AI, it, but you know that's a lot of extra work for no. Like it makes no sense to do that. Just step up to a twenty two Creed if you want to run those heavies, or step down to a 22 arc and if you're hand loading either one's going to be badass uh but anyway yeah you know. <sighs> you are making me a bit nervous i built a 16 inch six arc in intermediate length gas tube specifically run the light factory 80 grain eo dvts Ooh. you shouldn't be nervous if there's problems just figure it out uh, I will say this, 
the 80 grain DVTs. They're loaded with a different powder than obviously, you know, there's a different pressure spike happening there as compared to the factory 105s and the 108s and the 103s. From so far, what I've seen, if you're going to be running a flow through style suppressor or no suppressor at all, you have to make sure the gas port is opened up enough. Like if it's a 0 0.07 or smaller for some reason, that shit's probably not going to run unless now the one thing I haven't tried, I'm probably not going to for reasons, unless you went with a ultra lightweight BCG and buffer system, it's probably not going to run even on a, and a, you know, just a standard carbine length shitty spring and H buffer, like standard buffer weight. It's probably not going to run them unless the, the gas port is opened up a little bit. And that's, again, that's, we're speaking unsuppressed or a flow through style suppressor. If you're running, here's the caveat. If you're running a traditional baffled suppressor, more than likely it's going to run those anties just fine because you're getting so much back pressure. But it's, here's the thing about six arc and like a lot of these barrel manufacturers, there's, they seem to be figured out now, but a lot of them, like they're just copying what they know about like five, five, six, uh, gas arrangements and shit, which is kind of stupid. It's a total different base than the 556. So there are a lot of the gas ports are just undersized. Now, gas system length, blah, 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 blah. You know, it, it is what it is once you buy the barrel. You can always open the port up. If you don't feel comfortable doing it, take it to a gunsmith. They should be able to do it relatively cheap. Open the gas port up a little, like a point, point zero nine or something like that. Give yourself plenty of, of uh, gas port size there and put a at least an adjustable gas block if not a adjustable with bleed off like a superlative problem solved you shouldn't be nervous it's not a big deal what are your thoughts on the area 419 suppressor mounting system as far as a uh, repeatability and dependability i have several and i like them uh define repeatable because this is where things get a little twerked off like, can I unscrew the suppressor off of the, I think I have, I have both their systems. There's a Hellfire and I don't remember the bigger one, or maybe the Hellfire is a bigger one. I like their systems, uh, especially if you're going to be in a situation where you might use their brakes or their blast forwarding devices. I like their system. You know, they, Harry 49 makes high quality shit. So, you know, you're getting a good product as far as removing the suppressor and putting it back on return to zero. All the ones I have, which, I mean, there's a lot of muzzle device systems and everything out there, like uh, the hub systems and everything else. A lot of them do re return to zero or within like a half an inch most time. It's, you know, it, but if you're thinking like you're going to be able to remove the suppressor and it still stays zero, I don't know of a system that stays zero after you remove the suppressor and shoot. <laughs> Have you used the JP Silent Capture Buffer with the arcs and flow-through cans? No. I haven't even started going down the Silent Capture Buffer route because, you know, Armor Spec has theirs, JP has theirs, all that shit. Well, actually, that may not be true. I need to go look at... I have two six arcs. They haven't shot that much that are custom builds that may have one of them, at least one of them may have a JP. But as far as I'm aware, anything I've built, no. Uh, I'll tell you where I'm living at right now with buffer. I, I'm not totally convinced that a A5 uh, is absolutely necessary for the six arcs. Because I can, you know, carbine length buffer tubes running a heavier weight. I can get those bitches soft shooting as hell. It just depends. Like, you know, and it, this shit isn't, this shit isn't as complicated as some people are making it out to be. Like getting one to run and run fine is easy. But getting one to, like, I'm very picky. I want my long range platforms to shoot soft as possible. Probably, you know, that's, that's because I love bolt guns so much. I, it's probably, unrealistic expectations of what I'm trying to do. That's why I'm going through there and really trying to figure this out. 
Uh, but anyways. Yeah. J.P. Springs is what Sergeant of Arms likes in the their raffles. Uh, they, they've done two podcasts with us. Uh, and, you know, uh, I will say this. One, the, one of the only raffles, there's a couple raffles I haven't fooled with because they run. And they run smooth, all that shit. And as far as, like, the buffer weights and all that kind of bullshit, that is... Uh, my Sergeant of Arms 6 arc, my 16 inch 6 arc. Now, I have changed the furniture as far as the buttstock and, well, basically the buttstock and the scopes more than anything. But I told him exactly what I was going to be running, and that bitch runs really nice. So, you know, and I have a DNA uh, 6 arc. It may have a JP silent capture buffer on it. The only thing I don't like about the DNA one is it does have forward assist. I'm not a fan of that, especially on ARs. I'm just not a fan. Clamp on or set screw gas blocks, dealer's choice. If you have dimpled barrels, run set screws. If you don't have any dimpling and you don't want to try and get it done or anything like that, there's nothing wrong with set screw. I have multiple set screw gas blocks now. If you install them properly, they don't move. Or at least I've yet to see one move yet. Now, if I have my choice, like if I have a dimpled barrel, I'm running set screws. <laughs> Only hunting coyotes, 22 creed or 6 creed, do you load ammo? 22 creed is still not highly available as far as a factory ammo option. Like, ours always sells out immediately. Uh, Horizon kind of bought the, the the first X amount of horny ammo, and it's just it's well we have a bunch at Ally right now, but I don't know how other stores are doing. And it's eighty grain EODX and eighty grain EODM, which you know I don't get that, but whatever. Uh, and I wasn't impressed with that ammo. You know, I'm I'm just saying I'm not saying that because we, you know, we load the shit. I would like it, it to be really good so I could sell it on the website as a, another offering to help alleviate some of my pains of trying to keep customers fed ammo, but it's not that great. Uh, in my personal opinion, I tested through a bunch of different twin to cream wars, including a horizon there towards the end. Six Creed is different. Uh, you're going to find, well, in our area, anyways, the 87 grain V max is pretty readily available from what I've seen. And the 80 grain EOD VT is awesome. Our 80 grain AO DVT is a little bit better than Horty's. <laughs> but, you know, it depends. If you're hand loading, dealer's choice. We've talked about this at nauseum over the years, and I've done podcasts about it. Go find it. Because uh, when you start hand loading, and we're talking about only coyotes, it's six one way, half dozen other, if we're being completely honest. If we're comparing apples to apples, meaning a 70 grain projectile to a 70 grain projectile or a 75 grain projectile to a 75 grain projectile, same barrel length, and we're hand loading and we're ringing, ringing out the, the maximum amount of performance out of the cartridge we can, same twist rate barrels and everything else. It's, it's basically how. Well, Excluding some of the new modern projectiles, because that changes shit a little bit, like the 80 grain EODVT or the the 62 grain EODVT. If we're talking apples to apples, like a 75 to 75, you're going to be able to ring out a little bit more velocity out of the six creed due to the fact that it's not necked down as far. <laughs> but the projectile for the 22 creed is going to be a little bit higher BC, so it's going to be like almost neck and neck. Now. You, you, if you want to get into the nitty gritty of cost, 22 cal projectiles are typically cheaper than six millimeter projectiles. If you really want to get nitty gritty about performance, we've talked about this in past podcasts, uh, and I'm not going to get into it like as far as performance on fur. Now, neither one of these bastards is going to be fur friendly. Don't give a shit what anybody says. They're not. Now, as Flat shooting ass coyote dispatchers, they're both phenomenal. Take your pick. 
It probably, probably depends on if you're buying factory ammo or not. <laughs> Are you really the arc daddy? You and M team need another episode. Hey, I told M team like I'm to the point now where you can come out anytime. I'm thinking we're to the point now to where he's like, fuck that. There's a lot of rattlesnakes out there because he's scared of snakes, deathly scared of snakes. Uh, so it's, it's it balls in his court. Cause I told him like, they just let me know. Uh, I bet, I bet he'll want to wait till colder temperatures, which he's been missing out on some beautiful weather, which is unlike this part of Texas for this time of year. It's usually scalding ass hot. No, it actually was not that long ago, but it's been really nice out here. Uh, actually raining a little bit. Like it's, it's pretty crazy, uh, actually, but yes, we, me and MT need to record several more podcasts. One, I love talking shit with MT. And for those who don't know, we've known each other for years and a lot of the banter back and forth is just literally just that just shit talking. We really don't care. Uh, but it's funny to talk shit. You know, that's what we do. Uh, but there's a lot of different episodes, lots of different episodes that we want to record talking about thermals and rifles and all kinds of shit. Like we didn't get to nothing we wanted to last time. Can you explain to start basic load development and when to stick with a powder weight? <laughs> I'm, excuse me. I'm going to urge you to go listen to those podcasts. Uh, the text spread earning podcast over on YouTube, uh, did a reloading series that covers what I do in depth. Now, the shortest answer to your question is basic load development. What I do, no testing is stupid. Now I'm, I'm sure there's people on here that are going to hear them and get all upset and everything else, but I'm going to leave you with this. If you actually think, uh, no testing is relevant do your test, find your nodes, if you will, and then do the test again. Tell me if it's in the same place. It's not going to be. That's a stupid test. You can't replicate it. Now, what I do, now, it, it's not, you know, I have so much experience. I have so much previous data that it's, it's relatively easy for me to develop new loads uh, nowadays. But if you're working from home from a, you need to, you need to have some sort of reloading manual uh, that gives you a good starting point. And just know, as uh, long as you stay below, I know that's boring, but as long as you stay within their parameters and your everything's squared away and all that kind of stuff, you're, you're going to be fine. Don't be worried. But this is what I do. The, anytime I load, uh, do load development. To get to the load I want to test, I will load charge weights in one grain increments. I don't mess around with 0.2s and very, very seldom do I get into 0.5. Very seldom. It's usually one grain increments. And I start, again, a lot of times I already know because I have previous data or I'm looking at powder burn rate charts based off of other data and everything else. But let's say a book calls for a max charge of 38 grains and we're just making shit up right now. Don't write none of this down. I'm not talking about any particular cartridge. We're just talking. Let's say max charge on book is 38 grains. And I have said powder that they claim is the same, but I have a different kind of brass because keep in mind, Horny is going to be loading Horny components, changing brass, changing primers are going to affect these things. So don't never start at max, even book data. Don't never start at max. I'm going to back off say, Max book data is 38 grains. I'm going to back down to 36 grains, probably. I'm going to load around 36, 37, 38. And I'm going to fire these rounds one at a time. And I'm going to look at the effects of the brass. Like I'm looking for pressure signs. I'm also chronographing, getting velocities, seeing if, these charge weights are matching what books say or whatever the case may be. I'm also, you know, when I run the bolt, I'm, I'm feeling for uh, a heavy bolt lift. Shit like that. I'm just looking for pressure. If I get to 38 grains and it's giving me a velocity I want and there's no pressure signs, load, 
five rounds, or depending on the, the barrel profile, but load five rounds of 38 grains and shoot them. Shoot them into a group, cross your chronograph, see what happens. It's really that simple. But if you want to take it a step further, like I'm a little bit more advanced than a book, Wade. Uh, I, I step outside the boundary every once in a while. Okay. 35, 36, 37, 38, 39 grains. Now, be careful with certain powders going a full grain up. If you're using a fast burning powder, such as like a, I'm just throwing a random one out here, like a H4198, that could be what you shouldn't be doing that at 30 something grains in any cartridge, probably. But using an example, a fast burning powder such as that, jumping up a full grain is quite a bit. <laughs> so keep that in mind. But like I said, I, I always know what I'm doing, what powder I'm using. I know what to expect because I've loaded so much ammo in the past and I've done so much load development. I always generally know like where I can and can't go. But if you're at book charge weight and the velocity is slower and you see absolutely no pressure signs, it's not going to hurt to go up a grain. Go up another grain. Check for pressure. Check your velocities, everything else. If you catch a little bit of pressure on going up a grain, back off one grain, load five rounds, shoot them. See what happens. Now, there's a caveat to this. That's my that's my load development procedure. Because I already know, I have so much past data. I already know what combinations are probably going to work. And I can usually nail down a test load very quickly. I go look for pressure and I back off according to the volatility of the powder, essentially. Like sometimes you need to back off way more than just a grain. You need to back off two grains. Whatever the case may be, you just need to do your homework and research and keep keep data. Because the more data you keep, the the more informed you're gonna be the next time you develop ammo. But don't mess around with the point twos and point fives. Some people's powder machines can't even measure that that well. So like it's it's completely irrelevant and pointless. Don't load for nodes. That's stupid. Hit pressure back off, fire five round group. If it shows you a decent group at decent velocities and SDs, if that's what you're looking for, load more of that ammo. Load 20, load 30 more rounds. Run across the chronograph, shoot more five shot groups. Or if you're running like a, a, a skinnier profile barrel, shoot three shot groups, but shoot more. And if your data is pretty consistent, it's shooting the size groups you're looking for. It's shooting the velocity you're looking for. Load that ammo. It's really not hard, especially based, especially with modern cartridges, modern rifles. And like it, it should just, it's easy if I'm being completely honest. But always be careful when you're loading. Uh, I'm not telling you these are charge weights to use or powders to use. I'm just saying, for example, but always keep up with your data. As much data as you possibly can write down. The powder, the lot of powder, all that kind of stuff. Because keep in mind, like when we're talking about these uh, reloading manuals and their printed velocities and their powders and everything else, like the lot of powder you have could be totally different than what they use. So if you're coming in at the same charge weight and a much slower velocity or much faster velocity, it could be it could literally be something as simple as you're using a different primer, you're using different brass, you're having a different lot, a different a powder made at a different year. Like powder isn't the same every single year. That's why it's always good to update your reloading manuals. If you rely upon those quite often and things like primers can literally change uh, pressure spikes and velocities over. Like I've seen primer changes, change velocity up to like a hundred something feet per second. So keep in mind, like even though you have book data, it's always going to match the velocities you're seeing. And stop wasting time on nodes and stupid shit like that and uh, worrying about getting that, you know, 0.2 more grains of powder. That's stupid. Don't do that. Don't waste your time. And for God's sakes, I'm going to stop running on this after this one last thing. For God's sakes, if your rifle isn't broken in, don't even worry about load development. If you're, if you're just dying to load some ammo, pick a moderate load out of the book. And just load the ammo and shoot the shit. Nine times out of ten, if you pick a, a something that makes sense, say a 6.5 Creedmoor. 
I have a new 6.5 Creed more. I'm looking at my menu. I have my good OH 4350. I have some uh, 130s or 140 grain projectiles. I got my components. Uh, book says whatever the shit. I don't remember off the top of my head. Uh, I'm going to pick the 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 nine point whatever numbers. I'm going to pick like, uh, for example, this isn't a charge weight. I'm saying, for example, if it was 30 grains. I know that's a little low, but if it was 30 grains, it was a good middle of the road load for said reloading manual for 4350. Load that shit and just shoot the gun. Get familiar with the rifle, break the rifle in before you start worrying about load development. Chances are, if you don't waste a lot of time on stupid shit, one, you're going to get better at just shooting the rifle in general. Two, you're going to find that a lot of shit is stupid. That you, uh, completely unnecessary to find good loads. But that's a whole other subject for another day. <laughs> you got me on one. <laughs> is it likely that my 18-inch proof 6 arc with standard weight JP buffer and I can't read that. Loams? BCG and supportive arms gas block wide open to be under gas with all components installed properly. I don't know shit about your BCG. I'm not even sure if you meant like, I don't, I've never heard of that one. I don't know nothing about the JP buffer weight. What, you know, what weight it is. And also, Your adjustable gas block wide open. Do you mean fully open, meaning letting gas out? And are we in the bleed off mode? Or are you just like, we're in the non restricted mode, if you will? Under gas, probably not likely. But if you're trying to run 80 grain EOD VTs without a suppressor, you need to find a way to put, uh, you need to, one, take it out of bleed off mode. That's probably going to fix your problem. You need to find a way to put some uh, pressure back in the system on those 80 grain EOD VTs. Uh, I need some more information. Have you ran any Noveski six, six millimeter arc barrels? If so, did it perform as good as a as say a proof barrel. I have one well, before I answer that, let me think about it. Six arc barrels. I have one Noveski six arc barrel. It is a 12.5. Shoots fantastic. Uh, I do not have enough data, enough of a data set on that particular subject to say one's better than the other. I will say this. And I'm trying to recall off the top of my head. I'm not going to say. I, I don't remember off the top of my head my thoughts. Because, I, you know, when I log down data about barrels, AR barrels, or, you know, bolt action barrels, stuff like that, I log down all the pertinent information, which, you know, gas journal, gas port size, how the rifling look, shit like that. I leave notes. And I'm trying to remember what I thought about my Noveski. I don't remember. All, you know, the only thing that really sticks out in my head is, like, proof research barrels have always... Man, we just keep going back to proof. I've always been impressed with the machine work on the inside of proof research and how they shoot. They got the gas port sizes correct as well, in my personal opinion, and gas length systems. But anyways, uh, yeah, as far as sample size, I have one, me personally, have one Noveski 6 arc barrel. I'm probably going to get one of their 18 inches very soon. Because uh, why not? <laughs> <clears throat> hmm. what are your thoughts on using prs style shooting bags on the front of your tph chairs instead of an arc of ball head could the bags potentially be better at absorbing some of the wind vibration wobble Try and find out. If, hmm, yeah, try and find out. I wouldn't. I wouldn't do it. Uh, 
but I'm so goddamn spoilt. You know, I wouldn't go back to running anything but that system. But if if if, if uh, you're getting lots of wind vibration, if you will, you may try tightening your hub or lowering some of the components on your chair. It's hard to explain. Maybe I need to do a video about this shit. It's hard to explain that kind of shit. Just, like, just talking about it, but there's pros and cons to everything. One, we're keeping it so lightweight that it is, it's going to have some sort of, you know, vibration, if you will. Two, if you tighten down your hub, they get, you know, it, it takes up a lot, a lot more vibration, if you will, or the ability for it to move very easily. But also, if you spin that bitch all night with a much tighter hub, it's going to be pretty rough on your knees. I promise you. If you are have all your shit fully extended, like really high, obviously it's going to induce more sway. So lower it down. You know, you may have to hunch over a little bit to get comfortable on your rifle, but bring it down a little bit. Uh, you know, a couple things like that. But past that, uh, if you're going to try something like that, I would recommend take your shit out during the day, try, try it out before you go hunting. <laughs> Have you messed with Arc and Optics? This gets asked all the time. Yes, I have one, the EPL4, I believe, the 4 to 16. Finally recording a video on my first initial thoughts. Now, I'll just say I like him. You know, you're gonna have to wait for the full video to get the full, the full rundown. I like it enough to where I want to buy another one to do some real testing. Because I literally I bought this one used because I'm cheap. You know, I had said I was going to stop doing optics reviews, and I really don't consider myself an optics reviewer. I'm an optics connoisseur, and I get asked about it so much, I talk about it sometimes. To me, reviewing optics, uh, that needs to be like your only thing you do, and you need to be looking through optics all the time. You, need, you probably should have some sort of equipment like columnators or whatever the hell it's called, and probably much younger eyes. The more my eyes age, the more I've tried to get away from any kind of reviewing optics, you know. But if people ask me, I want to tell you what I think. I still kind of have an eye for glass clarity and stuff like that, but it is getting harder and harder. So, it's a, you know, that's a long freaking answer to your question. But, yes, I have one EPL4, I believe. I like it. I like it enough to where I'm going to buy another ARC, and I don't know which one yet uh, to do some more testing. But, anyways what's the most sold loads of ally ammo ally munitions i don't know i'd have to look up sales nowadays just about anything i put out sells out immediately uh which is fantastic and i appreciate everybody so very much i wish i wish i had help more help uh brooke helps me a lot the kids when they're here i pay them to do brass prep work stuff like that they don't get to anything important uh I've had several employees in the past. People, it, we live in an oil field town. One, I have to pay people a lot. Two, where the location is. A lot of people bitch about it, which whatever. Uh, but people end up moving on to other jobs. And I just kind of, you know, here, the last time I lost uh, a lady that was working for us, she quit. Uh, it's a very boring job for most people. <laughs> so it's just, it's not going to be a very popular job which is why I'm looking more and more into machines, but I'm, I'm always going to have that hand-loaded line option. Uh, but we're still doing a lot of ammo hand-loaded. Right now, I just have my machine set of two to three. I'm waiting on a newer machine to start adding some more machines that does a, some different things differently, but more on that later. But I don't even remember where I was going with that. I'm just rambling on here about loading ammo. But anyways, so it, it kind of comes down to like as far as you know, how much ammo I get out a week is how much time I have to load ammo or how much help I can get from Brooke. Brooke's loaded a lot of ammo too over the years. And like I said before, I have the entire process broke down into assembly line steps. So anybody could do it with a little bit of training. Uh, I would never let anybody just jump up there and do things without me uh, doing the quality control inspections, and everything else. So I have loaded a shit ton of ammo. The machine is already loaded a shit ton of can ham. Uh, 
and you know I've had several employees in the past and everything else. Just right now I'm running. And right now it's just literally just me and Brooke and the kids when they're here. Uh, so like our output isn't nowhere near what it could be, but just a wild guess because I've been loading it longer, probably 22 crate more, but I would venture to say six arc is probably scaring the shit out of it. Now, keep in mind, I had a 22 creed ammo alone. I had a pretty good, a pretty solid two year jump of sales when I had good help before we even started manufacturing six arc. I don't know. I'd have to look. And I'm not, uh, this computer I'm sitting by doesn't do that kind of stuff. Anyways, do you run diligent defense enticers? Do you have any pros and cons with the S versus the L or steel versus TI? You must be new here. <laughs> We've talked about this a lot uh, in the podcast. We've had Brandon, the owner, on the podcast twice. Uh, I do have a new podcast, a 2024 Wade's favorite suppressors coming out soon. I have to look at the schedule, the posting schedule, the, so yes, yes. Uh, as far as bolt actions, now I will run them on ARs, especially like two to threes. But like I said before, like on mostly on ARs nowadays, I'm in the, uh, I'm all about the flow throughs. Now that flow throughs actually got good. The, the Hux work seven, six, two TI, is a favorite of mine, and now the new Cat Noah. Uh, bolt guns, in my opinion, right now, still, uh, bolt guns all the way, diligent defense for the monies. Like, it's a fantastic suppressor for the money. And as far as which one, that's totally up to you. I have all of them. I have all of his cans except for his 22 can. Uh, still waiting on that to come in stock or whatever. Um, I like the S's, I like the L's, I like the TI's, the non-TI's. The, their steel suppressors aren't that heavy. So here's the way you need to determine the answer to this. It depends. <laughs> if you're trying to build an ultra lightweight hunting rifle or if weight is a concern whatsoever, get the TI. If you want more sound suppression than anything, get the L or the LTI. You're not going to be disappointed with either one. Got to get the backfire collab going. Ha ha ha. No, thank you. <laughs> uh, SCI, fantastic can for price. Uh, those cans punch way above their price bracket. hundred percent. I have, I don't know. Will they make five cans? I have their, their newest 8.6 can or whatever. I don't know what it's called. I don't remember. The STI, the LTI, the Enticer S, Enticer L. That's pretty much what I run on all my bolt guns nowadays. Uh, the ones that I'm shooting the most end up getting the Enticer cans on them. I'll also have two Wolf Hunters. <coughs> one is still on my Valkyrie, but the other one has migrated to uh, my 16 inch bolt gun. Fantastic suppressors. Great company. I'm thinking L, but I'm on the fence. If you don't care about it being a little bit longer, get the L. About that. Get the titanium one, unless you're doing lots of rapid fire sequences. You will be better off with the titanium one. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I mean, if I was going to uh, be burning this shit down on AR, I wouldn't get titanium. I'd just go for the steel. Or, you know, if you think about it this way, if like if it's in your budget to get two of the steel ones as opposed to just like one of the... It, it, none of them are expensive, but obviously the steel one's going to be cheaper than the titanium ones. If it's in your budget to get more suppressors, if you get the steel ones, get the steel ones. They're really not that heavy. Uh, obviously, the titanium is super freaking lightweight, but... As far as steel suppressors go, like some of you people ain't got some of these old ass suppressors I got that are like freaking bricks, but you can't go wrong with any of them. Just buy one. And while we're on the subject, if you're looking for diligent cans, <clears throat> now this is old information. This is from last week. 
Ally finally got their shipment in, and it was a lot uh, of diligent defense camps. Excuse me. <clears throat> S's, L's, T's, and non T's, because there has been so many people asking me looking for them for so long. We finally got them in. Now, I already posted about it once, so you may call before you go up there. I don't know what the inventory is. Call the store. <laughs> I like heavy cans and heavy rifles and advantage to the besides what? Any advantage to the TI besides weight? I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I mean, I shoot my, I shoot all those cans of quite a bit. There's obviously a noticeable, a notable difference between the L and the S's as far as decimal reduction. I'm not saying the S's don't perform fantastic because they do. Uh, other than price difference, no. I mean, uh, you could say an advantage is like, oh, eventually at some point uh, you'll stop noticing your TI cans flash as much, especially once they carve it up a little bit and you get all that old the the whatever particles were left over from manufacturing out like it just be, not be, becomes a thing the steel is obviously going to the stainless going to be should be able to withstand higher rates of fire and all that kind of stuff like that's all suppressor nerd shit if you're just hunting or long range planking and you're not burning this shit up on a machine gun just whatever you want and obviously stainless is always cheaper than ti titanium Rise, uh, rise iconic trigger thoughts. Don't have one. Don't have any thoughts about one. Not saying one thing or another about them. Uh, I'm familiar of them. Familiar of them. Don't have any. Yeah, I agree with that. He says titanium has a different pitch, but you probably won't notice it. More than likely, no. More than likely not. 18 inch six arc superlative gas block flow through can JP heavy silent capture buffer. Should I get a normal mass or low mass JP bolt care group? I already ordered the full mass. If you already ordered the full mass, wait till you have it, shoot it, see what happens. <laughs> uh, I, like I said before, I'm not familiar with, I don't, I know I have one or two rifles that have JP bolts. I don't know nothing about them. I've pulled them out and cleaned them. I haven't looked at them. I haven't even got to the JP shit yet. Uh, I don't know nothing about their their systems or anything like that yet. I'm, I've got a lot. I've already gone through a lot of systems as far as buffer weights, springs, and shit like that. I have yet to make it into jp territory other than the fact that i already have a few that have them on there those things run fine but i have no idea what exactly they are i haven't even looked at them that close yet uh i'm gonna say since you already ordered it see what happens when you shoot with it and before okay so one thing i forgot to mention when i was on my big rant earlier about uh six arc and gas systems all that kind of stuff if you're going to be building ar-15 rifles now If I was only going to build, well, if you own firearms, especially the availability of the price point that uh, bore scopes run nowadays, the test long or whatever shit it's called, you should have one. And if you're going to build AR-15s, definitely have one to check alignment with the gas block. I mean, you know, there's all kinds of little trips, tricks and tips you can do and all this other stupid shit. But if you just have a freaking... Uh, bore scope that's the easiest way to check alignment of a gas block after you're done uh check and make sure the uh gas adjustment screw is working properly and shit like that like just get one it's like 200 dollars. just get one make sure all this none of this shit matters if you don't have your gas block properly lined but anyways Ooh, got one for you. <laughs> I've got a 22-inch proof six arc 
with a superlative gas block in the maximum bleed off setting. I went with a braided spring and H4 buffer. It still feels as though I could lighten the recoil. Maximum bleed off with an H4 buffer. Are we talking about? I'm assuming we're talking about carbine. This is what I want you to do. <laughs> assuming we're talking about carbine. Before you go spend any money, dial that gas block the other direction. Go back. Go back. Get out of bleed off. Go back into restrictive mode. See what happens. You know, just, yeah, just see what happens when you start restricting the gas down. Uh, see if it makes it softer shooting or whatever the case would be. I'm assuming it's a proof 22 inch. That's, I think it's a rifle plus one. That's definitely an appropriately sized uh, gas porter. It should be anyways. If your gas block's appropriately aligned, like you're, you're letting a lot of gas out, which is good. Are we are we running a traditional style suppressor? Uh, before you go to spending money, run your uh, gas block the other direction. See what happens. See if it softens it up or whatever the case may be. Now, if you do that, and it doesn't really change anything, or if it makes it not run, you know, function properly or whatever the case may be. I would potentially look at getting into the A5. Like if you're you're that determined to get this thing softer shooting, you could definitely okay, back that up. Before you swap your buffer system to a longer buffer system, get on I think it's David Tubbs website. Get one of his flat wire springs. Also, um someone else makes them. Armor spec. Try those springs out with your H4. See how that feels. If you still don't like it, go to a longer gas system. Go to A5. <laughs> yeah. I'm about to get off here, guys. It's been normal. It's been right at two hours. Well, since I started messing with the shit. I'm going to answer a few more questions when we get off here. Because we're also getting down like 12 people. Low mass BCG gas block set on non restricted factory 105s, 103, ejected about four to five o'clock. 80s don't cycle. Yeah, 80s, 80s are picky. You need to. You need to. Well, I need more information, Weston. And if you already give it to me, I'm sorry because I'm getting a little little tired uh, no mass BCG check your gas uh, Jesus Christ I'm getting brain dead I'm sorry check your uh, gas block alignment if that's still not working for you you're probably going to have to enlarge your gas port <laughs> or uh, if you if, I'm assuming we're not running a traditional style suppressor. But again, check your gas gas block alignment with a bore scope, and then past that, you may have to go ahead and you may have to check the size of your gas port if you want those 80s to cycle. The new Dilgent 22 Ken is kick ass. Just got mine back. I definitely want one. I you know. I don't shoot 22s, 22 suppressor, 22 rifles nowhere near as much as I used to. Uh, but I think it's time for another 22 can. Arkin 4 to 16 or 3 to 18 for a 16 inch, 6 arc for 100 yards, 800 yards. Hey, you probably won't go wrong with either one. Regarding my question versus great, well, what? I don't know what that says, James. <laughs> Regarding my question versus great S currently designed, I don't, you're going to have to speak some English to me, buddy. 
I know you got a lot on your plate, but would the 17556 CAC be something that interests you? I know it's basically a wildcat, just as interesting cartridge since CAC has barrels and dies. I definitely want one. I actually had the shit in the cart a long time ago, and I just I get scatterbrained to get busy doing things, or I go to something else when I'm my window shopping at night on the cell phone. I just have it checked out. Now, I will say this. Uh, I'm always for having fun with shit. Like that definitely piques my interest. Now, will we ever offer ammo for it? Probably not. Like it's probably not just not going to happen. Will I own one? Sure. Absolutely. Suppressor is a wolf hunter on that 22 inch rig. I appreciate the inside. Have yourself a good evening. I've already forgot what we was talking about, man. <laughs> but anyways, you too. I'm answered like two or three more questions. I'm getting out of here. Have you tried fax and arms 22 mark barrel? I have not. I haven't tried any fax and barrels yet. I'm probably going to order some. That'll probably be the next barrel manufacturer I try out. As, as a matter of fact, faxing. Okay. Yeah, we got to a good stop point. I appreciate everyone, all 12 of you that are left through this two hours of just nonsense. Uh, appreciate everyone. And. As long as I can do these lives, I'll keep doing them when I can, when I have time. And we'll see you guys next time. Well, that's two hours. Two hours of answering questions. That's a pretty good live stream. A lot of good questions. Also, I go on like a little rants all the time about this shit. But if we decide to air this, we I definitely appreciate y'all sitting through, basically looking at the side of my face, answering lots of six art questions, which typically happens. Uh I'll kind of let Justin decide it whether this makes it out or not. But, you know, I can see where it'd be kind of boring. <laughs> Two hours of me just spouting off all kinds of shit and getting tired at the very end and finally getting off. But anyways, if this makes it out, we appreciate everybody, and we'll see you guys next time.